A very good morning to our esteemed dignitaries, teachers, and fellow mates. I, Vini Sharma, Vice President, Republica. And I, Madhu Jha, Reportering Head of Republica. On behalf of the Association of Political Science Department of Atmaram Sanatan Dharma College, extend a warm and hearty welcome to one and all present here. I would now like to invite Ms. Sharanya Vajja, our President, to introduce us all to Republica, the Department of Political Science, and our annual best Poli Forum. Republica, the Association of Political Science, ARSB College, strives to provide the students a field of obligation regarding responsibilities and role in growing advanced political and social surroundings, in addition to the expertise of importance of behavior in accordance to these directions. It does so through organizing conferences, seminars, quizzes, and debates to enhance academic skills. We are actively engaged in study of political science and arranging events and also to build the political scientists amongst us all. Today, we feel delighted to be gathered here for Poly Forum 2022, our two-day virtual annual departmental fest. Poly Forum is the annual fest of the Department of Political Science, ARSB College. We have been successfully conducting it with great pomp and vigor since 2015. Every year under the aegis of Poly Forum, uh, we organize various enriching and fun events such as debate competitions, slam poetry, stakeholders meet, quiz competition, etc. People from all over India participate with a lot of enthusiasm and make Poly Forum a huge success every year. This year, we received more than 200 registrations for all our events and we are delighted by such an overwhelming response. Thank you, Sharanya. It is our pleasure to begin this event with an inaugural seminar in collaboration with NIS, Nepal Institute for International Co Cooperation, Cooperation and Engagement on the topic Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Shambhunath Dupe, sir, teacher in charge of the Department of Political Science, to formally address the gathering, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, Atma Ram Sanatan Dharma College, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, Director, Nice, Nepal, Ambassador Sri Vishnu Prakash, Chair of this inaugural session of this webinar, all the distinguished speakers, Principal Professor G.K. Jha, colleagues, students and all participants in this two-day Poly Forum 2022, the annual fest of the Department of Political Science. In this inaugural session, we all are going to discuss one of the most important issue of the moment in the global politics, that is Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. At present, it seems to me, the way Russia is involved in this dispute, they have deliberately tilted the global order in their favor, as the NATO, led by America, is just a mute spectator of the entire world. We as Indians, believe that both these countries should engage each other in dialogue and resolve their concerns peacefully. And the UN should be proactive in resolving any issues of global concerns. I expect a fruitful discussion in this session and good wishes for Poly Forum 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shambhu, sir. It is my immense honor to now call upon stage Professor Gyantosh Kumar Jha, sir, Principal, Atmaram Sanatan Dharma College for the formal presidential address. Please, sir. Thank you. Good morning to all our distinguished guests in this inaugural session, Dr. Sambunath Dubey, coordinator of department, 
Dr. Amit Singh, Dr. Surendra Singh, and other colleagues, my dear students. I congratulate Department of Political Science, especially students who are organizing this Poly Forum 2022, in which we are going to discuss on a very current and pertinent topic, Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. I congratulate the organizing team for organizing this two days extra Vigenja festival for the students. And this discussion this international webinar. In fact, it is a need of this time to discuss and understand Russia-Ukraine relationship. And in fact, as an Indian, as a citizen of this country, we should also understand what is happening in the, what is happening globally, especially countries, how countries are behaving with neighbors and how it will impact to the whole world, how it will impact to our country also. So my best wishes to all the organizers, all the students, teachers, and the department for this program. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your motivating words. Thank you, sir, for your precious words. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, sir, Director of NIS, to share a few words with us, sir. Thank you, Madhu. Respected dignitaries, scholars, experts, and dear students, namaste and greetings from Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. It gives me immense pleasure to collaborate at the inaugural session of Atma Ram Sanatan Dharm College. University of Delhi, Republica, Association of Political Science at Poly Forum 2022. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurities are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. NICE has hosted several eminent leaders, policymakers, and public intellectuals like Noam Chomsky, John J. Mearsheimer, Stephen Walt, Professor Barry Buzan, uh, and several others from around the world. In last two years, we have published around 500 articles, hosted around 1,500 scholars through 120 events. We have hosted several international conferences such as NICE Global Conclave, where we had 220 scholars from 47 countries, International Women's Summit, Young Scholar Summit, International Conference on Understanding China, International Conference on International Migration, International Studies Conventions. NICE has its own flagship journal, Journal of Security and International Studies. Similarly, NICE provides an in internship program and visiting fellowship. During the pandemic, we started virtual internship and fellowship as well. We would like to request young students to join our virtual internship program. I would like to welcome all our distinguished dignitaries, speakers, and participants to a very important online panel discussion on Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. We would like to thank our chair, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, and the speakers, Professor Jeffrey Payne, Dr. Victoria Panova, Dr. Deepa Olapali, Cleo Pascal, Rosa Kangas and others for joining us today. We're really thankful to you all for accepting our invitation and joining from different time zones. It's very early morning in Russia and late night in the US, so we're really thankful. I once again welcome all our speakers and participants and thank them for their kind presence. The program is streaming live on our Facebook page. Please feel free to share it on social media. Wish you all wonderful deliberation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir. We would now like to invite Dr. Surendra Singh, sir, convener Republica, to welcome our distinguished guests. Please, sir. Good morning to all. Namaste. I welcome you to all of you. And under the able leadership of our visionary principal, <coughs> Professor Jantos Kumar Jha, ASD <coughs> College is contributing in knowledge sharing with the society. In continuation in that efforts, the Department of Political Science is going to organize these two days fest. I welcome to all of you, <coughs> Dr. Pramod Jaiswalji, Director Nice Nepal, Ambassador Mr. Vishnu Prakash ji, and all the organizing speakers and all distinguished speakers, colleagues, and my dear students. As a convener of Republica, I would like to extend my warm welcome to all of you in this year's annual fest, Holy Forum 2022. This year's <clears throat> annual fest of the Department of Political Science is going to organize on a very important topic, Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. This is a very important and very current topic. So I'm welcoming <clears throat> to all the distinguished speakers again, and we all gather here to listen to all of them. I'm not going to take <clears throat> much time to work. Just wish all my best wishes to them and the team Republica for their sincere efforts in the organizing this two day fest of the department. Thank you. And I, I hand over dice to the anchors. All the best. Thank you so much, sir. It is our honor that today's seminar is chaired by Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, sir, former Indian ambassador to South Korea. Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, sir, a law graduate, gold medalist, and a career diplomat, retired as India's High Commissioner to Canada in 2016. Hitherto, he was the ambassador to South Korea, official spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs and, Con and Council General to Shanghai. He also held various positions in Tokyo, New York, Moscow, Islamabad, Vladivostok, and Cairo. Mr. Prakash, sir, did a sabbatical with the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. Presently, he is a foreign affairs analyst, advisor, and columnist specializing in the Indo-Pacific region. He is associated with prominent think tanks, educational institutions, and writes regularly for national and international publications. He is a sought-after speaker and an expert panelist on Indian foreign TV channels. We have Professor Jeffrey S. Payne, sir, Manager of Academic Affairs, Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. Professor Jeffrey Payne, sir, currently serves as the Manager of Academic Affairs at the Near East South Asia, NESA, Center for Strategic Studies. He joined the NESA Center in 2012 after serving for five years as an instructor of political science at Butler University. As a longtime Asia hand, he conducts analysis on Chinese foreign policy, Indian Ocean, rim security, and maritime security. He is particularly interested in the inter intersection of maritime security and power competition in the Indian Ocean and the security dimensions of growing East Asia, Indian Ocean rim relations. Presently, he serves as the NESA Center's lead for programs that focus on the Indo-Pacific region. He also serves as the director of NESA's programmatic series on security challenges in the Indian Ocean region. His writings have appeared in China File, The National Interest, The Diplomat, War on the Rocks, SEMSEC, and the Middle East Institute's MAP project, among others. He has presented at defense colleges, universities, and research centers throughout Asia and Europe. We also have Cleo Pascal Ma'am with us today, non-resident senior fellow for the Indo-Pacific Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Cleo Pascal Ma'am was associate fellow, Shentham House Royal Institute of International Affairs, UK. Currently, she is a non-resident senior fellow for the Indo-Pacific at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, senior fellow at the Usana's Foundation, 
fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, a collaborator at the Network for Strategic Analysis, visiting fellow at the Centre d'Etudes et de Researches Internationals, DI University, D. Montreal, Serium, and on the International Board of Advisors of the Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies and the Global Counter-Terrorism Council. Next, we have Dr. Raj Roger Candice. Dr. Roger Candice is the academic dean and a professor of Central Asian Studies at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, a U.S. Department of Defense Regional Center. Previously, Dr. Candice served as a professor of Central Asian Studies at the George C. Marshall Center for European Security in garmisch partenkirchen Germany. Deputy Director of the Central Asian Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, Central Asian Course Coordinator at the Department of the State's Foreign Service Institute, Research Analyst on Central Asian Affairs for the Open Media Research Institute in Prague, Czech Republic, and as an Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Mississippi. Dr. Kangas has been an advisor to the combatant commands, NATO, ISAF, and various U.S. government agencies on issues relating to Central and South Asia, Russia, and the South Caucasus. He has written refereed articles and book chapters, as well as lectured to a range of audiences on these topics. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and a visiting fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Dr. Kangas holds a BSFS in Comparative Politics from Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and a PhD in Political Science from Indiana University. We welcome you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Victoria V. Penova. She is the Provost for International Relations of the Far Eastern Federal University. She also held the post of the Scientific Supervisor of the BRICS Export Council for the year of Russia's BRICS Chairmanship and Managing Director of the National Committee of BRICS Research. For the period of March 2016 to March 2017, she held the post of the Dean of the Oriental Studies Institute of the FEFU. Prior to that, she was an Associate Professor and Deputy Head of the Department of International Relations and Foreign Policy at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. She holds a PhD in the history of IR from MGIMO University. Her research focuses on club governance, gender issues, new technologies, and internet governance, sustainable development, as well as global governance. For her community activities, she acts as Women 20, Sherpa for Russia since 2015, and head of the Primorsky Region Women Un Union of Russia since 2018. She is a member of the governing board of the Russian International Studies Association, expert of the Russian International Affairs Council and member of the Cyber BRICS Advisory Board. For the period of 2003 to 2014, she served as a regional director for Russia of the G8 Research Group based at the University of Toronto, Canada. She was a member of the National Working Group of the Advisory Council of the Civil G8 in 2005 to 2007, part of the Common European Security Project initiated by High Commissioner J. Solana in 2009, since the Russian BRICS presidency in 2015, she is also co-chair for the civil BRICS process initiated by the Russian Civil Society, permanent member of the jury for the Youth 820 BRICS. Dr. Penova publishes in a variety of national and international journals. She was visiting fellow and now a life member at University of Cambridge, London School of Economics and Political Sciences, BRICS Policy Center, PUC Rio. Dr. Penova is also an alumni of the Asian Forum on Global Governance organized by ORF India and Zayed Stiftung Germany. We welcome you, ma'am. Our last speaker for the day is Dr. Deepa M. Ullapalli. She is Research Professor of International Affairs and the Associate Director of the Sigur Center for Asian Studies at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University. She also directs the Rising Powers Initiative at the Sigur Center. She is a specialist on Indian foreign policy, Asian regional security, and comparative foreign policy outlooks, outlooks of rising powers. Her most recent book is Worldviews of Aspiring Powers, Domestic Foreign Policy Debates in China, India, Iran, Japan, and Russia, Oxford University Press, 2012. Another volume, Nuclear Debates in Asia, is forthcoming from Roman and Littlefield in 2016. She is completing a new book on energy security worldviews in Asia. She also authored The Politics of Extremism in South Asia, Cambridge University Press, 2008. 
She has published extensively in journals such as Foreign Affairs, Asian Survey, The National Interest, and Political Science Quarterly. Dr. Ullapali has received major grants from MacArthur, Rockefeller, and Carnegie Corporation for projects related to India and Asia. She served on the board of directors of Women in International Security, Washington, D.C., and is an advisory council member for Women in Security, Conflict Management, and Peace, Delhi. She is a frequent commentator in the media, including appearances on CNN, BBC, CBS, PBS, and Reuters TV. She holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University. We welcome you, ma'am. Now, we would like to invite to the speech to our chair, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, to come forward the program, sir. Thank you, Mary. Good, good morning and namaste, uh, Nice to see you. Good evening. Nice to see everybody. Uh, thank you, Veni. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, Sharanya. Uh, Dr. Jaiswal, before I start, how much time do we have? Do we close at 12.30? Do, uh, do we extend it? Uh, 12.45 maybe. Because All we right. have to end the program at 1. So 12.45. Lo lovely, lovely. Thank you. Uh, Principal Dr. Jha, Director Pramod Jaiswal, my fellow panelists, members of the faculty, young students. I am absolutely delighted that you are here in numbers. We have more than 150 uh, attendees uh, on Zoom and then we are gone live on Facebook and other uh, uh, my, uh, micro blogging channels. So I think we have a very good attendance. And I could not have hoped for a better uh, uh, group of colleagues, friends, uh, who are very knowledgeable uh, and uh, who have very rich perspectives to bring to us. Let me start off with a few comments of mine. I regard this, dis uh, this conflict as a completely unnecessary man-made disaster we should never have happened. Uh, for me, two conclusions are inescapable. One is the short-sighted approach of NATO to squeeze Russia. The eastward expansion of NATO, which is completely unwarranted. And their hypocritical, even untenable stance that it is not meant to contain Russia. And then on the other hand, there is the overreaction of President Putin, who had difficulty in reconciling to the dissolution of Soviet Union. What he has done is aggression cannot be condoned, notwithstanding the provocation. It would seem that he has overplayed his hand and miscalculated his own strength, the Ukrainian resolve, the global reaction, the intensity of Western sanctions. Notwithstanding the information warfare and the Western narrative, Russia has exercised restraint and tried to limit civilian casualties. But seemingly, the military campaign has stalled, is at crossroads. Failure is not an option for President Putin. There is too much at stake uh, for Russia. But pushing ahead would mean use of massive air power and would cause unconscionable destruction and loss of life. What is Ukraine's fault? It's paying the price for being located on a geopolitical fault line and is being all sacrificed at the altar of power politics. The Ukrainian ambitions were encouraged by the West, but has now been left to fend for itself. Western arms and equipment is prolonging the conflict, inflicting great misery on the Ukrainian people. President Zelensky has shown amazing bravery, but question is whether it is now descending into bravado and bluster. He continues to inspire his countrymen and also poke and provoke Russia. Unfortunately, all sides are engaging in brink brinkmanship and the situation is caught caught in an escalatory spiral. The sides are going through the motions of talking. The big question is whether well-meaning countries, leaders, 
like uh, the French president, the German chancellor, the prime minister of Israel, the Indian prime minister, etc., and the others can encourage all sides to cool down and engage in meaningful discussions to find a modus vivendi, give diplomacy a chance. Friends, as, as a lifelong diplomat, I can say with a, a great deal of certainty that the diplomacy is only way forward. India has been encouraging all sides to return to the negotiating table. Prime Minister Modi has urged President Putin to speak directly to President Zelensky. Uh, let me just take a minute to speak about India's stance, which is anything but neutral. India has unequivocally stated that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries must be respected, that international law must be adhered to, that human rights of Ukrainian citizens be protected, that the hostilities be stopped, and the sides come back to the negotiating table. We have not formally uh, used the word aggression or invasion. But in essence, we have made it known what we think of the Russian action. We have considerable skin in the game. We are in the midst of a dangerous challenge, a standoff with China. We have a legacy of close relations with Russia and a critical dependence on Russian military hardware. And then we have an unprecedented high caliber strategic partnership with Russia and the European nations. With these brief opening remarks, let us take the discussion forward. I would like to compliment NICE and uh, the uh, other institutions for this timely initiative. We have now two hours and uh, 10 minutes. So may I suggest the following format? I will invite each panelist to make initial remarks of 12 to 15 minutes. And as usual, I will be the party pooper. I'm, I'm known to be the party pooper. Uh, I will give a one minute prompt to, uh, when, for, to, for the panelists to wind up. The prompt will go this. This is the first gong. And you do not want me to sound the gong twice. So when I go, you will indulge me by bringing the, disc the conversation to a hard stop. I would thereafter, after we've done the rounds, I'll pose a couple of questions and also possibly invite each panelist to pose a question or a comment to fellow panelists. We will then have another round of discussions with everybody having three to five minutes and then open it up to the floor or have discussions amongst ourselves. So with these opening remarks, let me turn to Dr. Victoria uh, Panova. Uh, as I said, I am proud to be the first Consul General in the world in Vladivostok and was delighted to see uh, a Russian friend from uh, who is a Moscowite but has uh, dropped anchor in Vladivostok. Uh, she has already been introduced. I will not do that. Dr. Panova, the floor is yours. We are all ears and you have all of 12 minutes. Go right ahead. Thank you so much, Ambassador Prakash. Um, just a few things I need to say before. I will be speaking in my personal capacity, obviously. And I want to give special thanks to uh, Dr. Pramod Jaswal uh, and NICE, and also to our to my Indian colleagues in here. And this is a real pleasure for me to be speaking at the Poly Forum in the, this particular session and uh, giving you my own personal experience from over the past, well, I think it's like a decade or something. Um, I've been very heavily, as you heard at the beginning, involved and still involved in the negotiations within the BRICS. But I've been also part of the expert consultations track to diplomacy on the uh, European or Euro-Atlantic direction. And it was interesting to see that uh, 
each country has its own interests. It's obvious. Each country has its own concerns, its own limitations, and its own uh, problems. And uh, nevertheless, over all the years of, of my personal experience that I had of negotiations with my partners, either from the BRICS, uh, from um, uh, with ASEAN, with other South Asian countries, uh, we always were managing to listen to each other, uh, not always coming to full consensus in all the details, but always coming to some kind of uh, fruitful, um, both positively encouraging result in uh, looking into new areas of cooperation, looking into new areas of uh, joint endeavors, projects. Uh, and what I've been witnessing, it was at first I was like really um, on a personal level, very much disappointed, but they then kind of used, grow, grew to you to under, not understanding, but getting used to that. That when I talk to my colleagues uh, from uh, their groups, uh, the expert groups that involve UK, European Union, um, very often it would be just uh, giving official positions, stereotyping, not ready to move beyond uh, any limits. And um, it was really not something what you engage when you engage into, into diplomacy talks, when you engaged into discussion. So it should be steps and compromises on both sides or on all the sides. And this is something, there's mutual respect, mutual uh, listening, that uh, countries of the non-golden billion are ready and able to do. And this is something that unfortunately I witnessed the golden billion countries not ready to do any longer. And um, this is why we are, what we are seeing now, it's very much, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm thankful to Ambassador Vishnu Prakash for a balanced approach to that. But I say it's not just a conflict uh, that, uh, but not a bilateral conflict. It's really much wider. It's a uh, civilizational level, not of what Huntington was talking about, because Huntington was rather also uh, dividing different groups according to their ethnic, religion, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think this is rather um, a conflict and their attempt of the West to retain status quo counter to uh, and, and stop and actually reverse their development of other countries, their ability and their um, and the necessity to stand to their own national interests. I will re re very briefly go into history. Uh, that's good that Ambassador have already talked a bit of it, but uh, since as a kind of scholar in this area, I've been very deeply looking into the matter. And I remember at the times when their uh, Soviet Union broke apart and we saw and we were very happy about their end of the Cold War, there was a general enthusiasm in Russia and the desire that, well, now we have our friends, we're partners, and we need to build a new world without any dividing lines uh, on the, in the area of, um, with our former opponents, former foes. And uh, unfortunately, for some time in the 90s, uh, Russia was too overwhelmed with, with its new Western friends that uh, for some time until U Eugene Primakov, and I'm sure Ambassador Prakash have known him personally, um, uh, he, until he promoted becoming first foreign minister, then prime minister, that actually West is not the whole world. Uh, Soviet Union uh, earlier and then Russia, they have very uh, reliable, very and real friends from other parts of the world. In India actually being the, one of the most reliable and, and um, uh, real partners, real friends. And uh, he reminded us first suggesting this uh, trilateral cooperation between India, China and Russia, which didn't come 
fruitfully at that point, but then it evolved a while ambassador have mentioned that there's still uh, problems and uh, between China and India, nevertheless, those two countries are um, talking and, and are ready to overcome uh, their problems and, and this is good to have this trilateral format and also to remember that there are other parts of the world not just mentioned one but the Latin America Africa and they all uh, having their paths of development they are having their civilizational approaches they are having their culture their mentality and it's important that we have this mutual respect ingrained um, and uh, Nevertheless, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, Russian official position, uh, gradually moved from total Western adoration to a balanced approach and diversification of foreign policy. But what we saw during this enthusiasm, uh, Russia was suggesting to introduce their architecture of international relations that would not have any walls in between. So it was quite strange for Russia to see NATO still active, but not just active, but then started to enlarge. I know it's a long and, and probably already uh, you're kind of tired of this talk, but this is uh, obvious. And each of you should think if your country have some uh, big other opposing, oppositioning country that doesn't like you, and doesn't really want you to be strong and healthy and prosperous. And this country uh, ensures that there is a, a military bloc that is expanding closer and closer to your borders. It's, uh, you would definitely not buy the talk of those politicians that this is just uh, very peaceful you are not approaching, you're not integrating Russia. And there was the suggestion that OSC should be serving instead as a very comprehensive body, as a peak of the architecture where political, economic and cultural issues would, be, would all be having uh, equal force, equal um, position and where uh, our countries would be able to talk on not on block level, but to each other uh, and discuss issues that are pertinent for common security. All of you are scholars and you all know what a security dilemma. And security dilemma obviously is about the thing that you cannot, you can actually have a reverse uh, situation with economic security. If you lose some of it, if you trust the partner that betrayed you, you would be uh, kind of somehow able to recover, uh, but if you uh, kind of in the area of security, you cannot do that. And this is why there are certain areas of national security that are not uh, divisible. They are indivisible with the security, national security of the other states. So uh, with the Russia first, uh, when Medvedev was uh, president suggesting their uh, European tre security treaty, and then now those uh, suggestions that we are, I think those even were two months, the trust uh, asked for legal um, uh, guarantees of security for itself from NATO. Uh, none of this was ever taken in serious. And um, one thing, I totally agree with you, Ambassador, that anywhere is a, a, a impossible. Any conflict is impossible. And every life is extremely precious. Uh, and we Russians know it probably, uh, not maybe not better, I would not be so, uh, but at least not worse than anybody else, especially after losing 27 million people during the World War II. But nowadays what we saw is that for eight years, I'm sure many of you have known, but uh, for some reason, uh, Western press, which is dominating their, um, uh, their site now, uh, was never talking about Donbass people. Actually, I, I don't listen neither to Western press nor to our press. I do not believe official uh, media. 
but why I can be talking surely about the situation, the really drastic situation and the people and, and children killed in Donbass over the past eight years is because I've been talking to such people. I've saw refugees who've been either, uh, I've been meeting occasionally like my manicure lady who fled Donbass and her, uh, she couldn't take out her mother and father from there because she didn't have enough means uh, uh, from, she had some relatives there, but she did, couldn't draw them from there. And she's been telling terrible stories of how they were surviving under shelling from Ukrainian uh, forces and from Nazi bots, uh when they were there, how they actually were sitting in the basements. I've had some people whose relatives were there. And you know what they were, what was their first reaction? It's from people, it's not from the press when they learned about it, uh, when, when it's all started, they said, finally, they will understand what it is for, what it's been for us for eight years. They've been under fire of their own government that was not ready to talk to them at all for eight years, never. And Russia has been actually uh, doing, putting lots of efforts into putting forward the diplomacy skills and ensuring, and we had those Minsk agreements that uh, you remember Kiev talk, they always said, first they were saying, okay, okay, but they never did it. And finally Zelensky was even openly sabotaging it. Victoria, and, 30 seconds, please, if you don't sure. mind. I'm so sorry, uh, so, but 30 seconds. Yes, I understand. So um, uh, sorry for becoming a slightly emotional, but this is about people. This is about real people, not staged like videos, fakes that very much uh, the ones I find are actually coming from, uh, they say it's from now, but it's from 2014 or things like that. But this is not about, this is about people. And I don't understand why is it that everybody started talking about people's like people's life is equally valuable. And it doesn't, the people of Donbass, the child from Donbass, their life is equally valuable to either one of us. And that is why I think we definitely should go ahead with their uh, ensuring that, that the conflict is stopped, but it should be ensured that all lives are saved. And uh, I really much once again value their uh, site that uh, India and Nepal, I have provided with this polyform. I think we have to uh, actually understand. And, and you know what, I want to finish with the words. I'm proud to be Russian, and I'm sure the truth will be there and it will be understandable, in, even with the, all the domination of Western press that we have now. And I really do hope for more critical thinking from the young people, but not only. So thank you very much. I'm ready to respond to all your questions. Well, thank you, Victoria, for your emotional but thoughtful remarks. Uh, it is true that, as you said, it would be no, the world would not have come to such a pass if sides had listened to each other and there was strategic accommodation. Uh, and also that security is indivisible. But may I also say that two wrongs don't make it right. So, uh, well, Again, let's face it, innocent people are suffering, but uh, let me move on. With this, uh, I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Cleo Pascal. Uh, Cleo, looking forward to hearing your perspective. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Principal Professor Gantosh Kumar Jha and, and Dr. Shambhu Nath Dubey and Dr. Singh and Dr. Jaiswal and uh, our great student leaders, Vinnie Madhu, Sharyana. I hope I got that right. Um, nice, nice has been doing a, a great job and uh, um, really appreciate what you're doing and especially partnering with uh, Republica and ARSC College because you know, for the students here, um, this is a, a moment in history that is, um, um, other, other students will be studying it in 50 years to try to figure out what happened and how this cascaded out. And you've already lived through COVID in Afghanistan. So those are other two other kind of cataclysmic events. So if you think your textbooks are out of date and you're overwhelmed with trying to understand what's going on, uh, I completely understand. And we, we couldn't have a better guide through this than Ambassador Prakash. And if it was, who was 
it was my option. I just let him talk for the whole time. I completely agree with, with what you just said, of course. And uh, I need to get myself one of those gongs for when I moderate. Um, <laughs> it makes him particularly helpful. <laughs> Um, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, not a topic expert. Um, what I, I'm going to take the second part of, uh, of the topic, which is the global order question. Um, because we're, we're at a, in a very fast moving situation at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm going to look at the, the sort of political warfare aspect, or as Ambassador Prakash called it, information warfare, which is you know, the same, basically, kinetic warfare. Uh, and then the systemic changes. So the kind of three things that are hap going to happen or are happening sequentially. And in the, the context of the information warfare uh, of coverage and discussions about this event, um, as, as, was, as Dr. Panova mentioned, you know, about who do you watch and what coverage do you get and how does it shape your impression? Um, I, I think that these last two years, um, have created an enormous amount of distrust in the media in general, especially as we were kind of stuck into our houses and pushed online and uh, couldn't just talk to people normally. And especially around coverage, um, for example, with COVID, um, there, there were questions about how the Lancet covered it. There are questions about how you know vaccines were approved from certain countries or not other countries. But there, there's a whole questioning of uh, what is a reliable source um, that was then compounded uh, by the, the economic desperation that occurred around the world uh, because of COVID. Uh, and the, quite frankly, in, at least in the West, a lot of mental health issues that came about because of the isolation and the fear, um, uh, which gave rise to things in Canada like the trucker convoy, which was essentially um, about the, that, that environment that had been created that was driving our suicide rates are off the chart, um, that sort of thing. And, and combined in, with that, you're seeing um, disruptions. I mean, I, I've, I've done quite a few panels that have to do with terrorism. I've, I've never seen an aggressive spamming of a topic like I just saw here. And um, uh, con I congratulate the, the kind of moderators, online moderators for kind of clearing out that noise. But there's this, this, this consistent dis disruption, attempts at disruptions in every aspect of our lives. So into that comes, um, it comes this war. And um, so the, when you're looking at it from the point of view of somebody in India, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about perceptions and how various information uh, warfare or whatever is shaping our strategic environment globally. What happened with the Indian students was, uh, was, was important. Um, you know, the, the way that it was covered, so in the West, it wasn't covered that much, uh, but within India, uh, you know, there, were, there was footage of the Ukrainian, what was said to be the Ukrainian border guards being outright racist towards uh, Indians and others who were trying to leave the country. Um, in the India uh, mounted Operation Ganga, which is kind of, which was unbelievable. It's, India was the only country I saw that put together such a program to uh, evacuate their people and also pretty much others. But it fed into this narrative that um, why is India getting dragged into a white Western war um, and becoming a, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a tragedy. It's a huge tragedy for everybody involved as Ambassador Prakash has said quite eloquently, um, but India didn't cause it. And India is still dealing with the aftermath of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And, um, and these are kind of unresolved. I heard somebody on the Indian News say these are unresolved common European security problems that date from the 90s. Um, and so there's, there's, and that's where we saw things like the abstention, the Indian abstention, and similarly the UAE abstention. And that, because of the media environment, I'm in the US at the moment, here in the US, because of the, the way the information is being projected here, that becomes almost not understandable. And a lot of pressure is put uh, on uh, India around things like the Quad. This came out quite publicly that 
you know, there was pressure from the U.S. side to to turn Ukraine into a quad issue, which India resisted. Um, and that raises this other question, which is if there is that increasing Western pressure uh, to create this, to, to, to drag the Indo-Pacific into, into Europe, um, now that we have, and again, this is something I'd be very interested to know what Ambassador Prakash thinks about this, now that we have a new president in South Korea and uh, a more vocal uh, Japanese, I mean, with Prime Minister Abe saying even maybe uh, place nuclear, American nuclear things in, uh, in Japan and India in its own position, you know, do we start to see a, a, a much more Asian centric quad in terms of what it'll do and, and what it won't do. The other thing is that I think that that the that Western analysts um, ha, have haven't have really not understood the depth of that Russia India relationship. You know, if you're m many of the of influential uh, Indian analysts are in their 60s or 70s. If you're in your 60s or 70s, you probably trained in the Soviet Union at some point and have developed those personal relationships. And you probably remember what happened in 1971. I haven't heard the USS Enterprise brought up more often outside of a Star Trek conference <laughs> recently. It's, it's, because, it's a, these touchstone issues. And the, and the US has not covered itself in glory in Afghanistan and India has to work with Russia, obviously to, to deal with that. Um, and the same is true for many countries that were of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. You know, these are old relationships and, uh, and they're not gonna go away. And I think that really isn't understood um, how that could play out with if there is consistent pressure from the West around things like economic structures um, and whatnot, which brings me to the systemic question. What systemically does this mean? Could this mean going forward? And with Russia getting blocked out of the Western economic system, if that continues, you know, this is not the Cold War anymore. There are alternatives. And you might start to see much more of this, you know, Ruby Rupal swap. Um, you, you can, different methods of moving money, different methods of investing money. Um, and the US dollar is, is, is not what it, what it was. And if you see a crash in the US dollar, that, that has obviously huge implications. And of course, the increase in oil prices and the increase in food prices are very bad for a lot of places. Um, and, and attempts will be made to bypass those, uh, those um, American blocks. I, mean, I think that's probably what that Vladivostok Chennai corridor is, is partially about in terms of at least oil. Um, and I don't, I think if there was an attempt to block uh, India from buying oil from Iran now, I don't think that would have happened either. Um, similarly, in terms of media, we're starting to see um, uh, a, f a fleeing to these third systems. I can't tell you how many people in the US have forwarded me clips from, from Weon <laughs> recently. Um, it started, started around, especially around the, the truckers protest. So the, this, this attempt to create uh, kind of a, a Western blockade of Russia because of these other countries' linkages into Russia and because of dissatisfaction with some recent American policies and longer term American policies for all of these reasons, it's just not, it, it's not working. And um, it's fracturing the world at a time when we're still very uh, vulnerable from, the, from COVID, from what happened uh, socially, economically, and politically with COVID. So into, into all of that comes, um, comes China, right? This, so this is, this is, we focus on Russia, but you know, if you're looking at the Indo-Pacific, that's not the problem so much. The problem really is the Chinese Communist Party. And we know that the Chinese Communist Party is not gonna be, um, it's gonna be looking for angles. And what it's going to see is, um, you know, it, if NATO, it, you know, there was, there was the big hit from Afghanistan. We'll see what happens here with, uh, with support for Ukraine. Um, but the big kinetic message from Ukraine for China is, uh, is you got to hit fast and you have to cut off communications so that the uh, defenders can't get out their message quickly. Um, 
that means that if they go after Taiwan, Taiwan could fall extremely quickly. And then that could go down the coast. It could have a cascading effect down the coast and across the Pacific Islands. So all I'd say, um, just to conclude, uh, is that India is potentially a big part of the problem of stabilizing it. We saw it with the students, go back to the students. In that case, India took, its, took itself and others out of a very dangerous situation in the Ukraine and no pressure, uh, but we'd like to see India help <laughs> take its part of the world out of danger in this situation as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pascal, for uh, very thought-provoking remarks, a very sober uh, assessment of the situation. I completely agree with you that what is happening is fracturing the world, which had already developed cracks and uh, doesn't augur well. You're talking of distrust of media. Uh, yes, it has gotten enhanced, but uh, let me go back on a lighter note uh, during my Soviet days. There were two papers called Pravda and Izvestia. And uh, Pan Ms. Panova would perhaps bear with me, my Russian friends would say, Pravda means truth and Izvestia means news. Pravda does not have any truth and Izvestia does not have any news. So, you know, this problem of media having its own angle is a very old one. It is getting accentuated. Thank you for mentioning Operation Ganga. It was a whole of government approach. And I think uh, the way every country responded, we are very grateful. Uh, you mentioned about India's stand. You know it's all about choices and you need to have uh, flexibility. That is the name of the game. Every country does that. Quad is comparatively a nascent organization uh, and Quad is, meant, is not a UN Security Council. It is basically meant for the Indo-Pacific region. So I think we should be careful in ex overreaching ourselves. Last point, I, I am afraid uh, the Ukrainian leaders must be ruining the day when they gave up the nuclear weapons. That is one message that, uh, not very desirable message that has gone out uh, to the world is that if you have nuclear weapons, you're comparatively safer. And what we are going to see, unfortunately, is an arms race and a quest for weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I know these are things not said easily, but uh, that is how I look at it, uh, given the situation. With this, uh, let me welcome Dr. Deepa Olapalli. Uh, Dr. Deepa, we have been eagerly looking forward to you joining us. I'm told that uh, you do not have much time, so we will make the best of it. And ma'am, you have 11 minutes and 60 seconds at your disposal. I will be the timekeeper. Uh, you have already been introduced, so I will not repeat that, but I look forward to joining you as a TV panelist uh, one of these days. I wonder how our paths have not crossed, but so happy to see you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me, and I apologize that uh, I had a, a little shorter time. I actually am sitting in India, uh, and I arrived from the US just recent part of the issue. Um, but I'm very pleased to be able to speak to so many young scholars who, uh, as, uh, as the speaker before me said, will be, in fact, the inheritors of this mess that uh, we are facing. Um, I do have, just in order to keep uh, my thoughts in uh, order, I do have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, which I normally don't do, but I think it might be useful. I want to basically, uh, I'm, I'm touching on a number of issues that uh, I was asked to look at. So a big picture as well as the immediate issues um, uh, in addition to the global order. So let me just share the screen. I hope I can make this thing work. Okay, so I hope everybody can see this, Ambassador. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. very well. We can okay. see it very well. Go ahead, please. Okay. All right. So let me just start by saying that I view this whole situation as a failure of great power diplomacy. All right. We had a, um, for, you know, post-World War II, we had kind of a tacit understanding about when and where and how competition would take place. And 
war between big powers in this situation was kind of ruled out. And so this has come as in some sense a shock to the entire system. Um, but I will say that um, one of the things that the, if you think about how we got to the state, uh, I think we have to understand that um, the Biden team, I think the, it did not, you know, realism is something that I think many of us may not particularly care for the uh, concept of realism, but among great powers, it's a concept that I think needs to be taken seriously simply because of the cost and consequences of a breakdown as we're seeing right now. So I do believe uh, from my own take that the NATO expansion was a proximate as well as a broader cause. George Kennan, I take this uh, view of George Kennan, uh, Mearsheimer and so forth, who uh, normally I may not be in the same company as with, but in this case, I do think it's uh, one has to take into that uh, explanation as well. Um, I also think that what we're seeing is that, you know, without going into all the details, given the lack of time, each of these, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and US, I think they've all overplayed their hands and overestimated the leverage they have on each other. And um, the, well, of course, that leads to the point of how do you get out of this? Uh, but one point on how we had this of great power diplomacy, I would say that the Biden team, you know, when I was sitting in Washington, D.C., I was um, rather appalled, I must say, at the way in which there was a lot of public open diplomacy by Mr. Biden himself calling out Russia and suggesting that the invasion might happen anyway. I was there during that time. It was almost, you know, every few hours, you get a message saying that, well, they're going to, in, the Russians are going to invade in, um, in the next few hours, next day, so on and so forth. It, in some sense, I see it as a self-fulfilling prophecy because when you have that kind of public calling out, I think it's very difficult for a uh, diplomatic uh, behind the scene kind of uh, bargaining and negotiation that really needed to take place, which is why I say it's a failure of great power diplomacy first one and hopefully, uh, and perhaps maybe not the last, but the uh, other point is, what are the interests that drove these countries? Um, if I just uh, very quickly, I suggest that in the case of Russia, it's two things, which is the security um, environment uh, with the expansion of NATO, as well as regaining status the core interests of these uh, of, of Russia. Regaining status, of course, could be grandiose, depending on what Mr. Putin's idea of status is, which is one of the big problems right now that we're facing, because how much and how large of an of a, of a ambition is he having? And we can't read his mind. So that is one issue. But I think in December 2021, let me just say one thing. There were two agreements that were proposed by the Russians to have an agreement, a promise from, basically they called it security guarantees that they wanted from Ukraine, promising not to join NATO and also to uh, reduce NATO uh, uh, troops and military uh, positions near in the Eastern European countries. So that was of course not followed through and I think you're seeing the effect of that now. Ukraine, I think, is protecting its identity as much as um, security. I think the identity issues um, is, a, is, a, is a very big importance. And we see how that's being played out, uh, especially by the, um, the, pre the, the, the leader of the Ukraine right now. Uh, very popular in terms of mobilizing that Ukrainian uh, independence. Um, US. But the difference is, of course, here that the U.S. interests here, unlike Ukraine and um, Russia, which are core interests at hand, in the U.S., I think I would call it much more diffuse interests, um, liberal principles defending it, as well as maintaining American credibility, which are much more expansive and diffuse. And so, in a sense, 
there are more choices from the US side than perhaps when you're defending territory and identity on the ground. For the Europeans, um, I think it really came down to maintaining transatlantic unity um, with the American pressure, especially on Germany and the Nord Stream 2 questions, it was a very big moment of choice, which uh, perhaps uh, it, was, it had no choice at that time. Uh, it seemed as if uh, the way in which the, the um, events were happening. But I do think that, you know, I think more than anything, this is a case where the transatlantic unity issue became very, very important. Along, I, I, it, to me, I'm not so, uh, it's not so clear to me that European security is at stake in the way that we are seeing it being uh, the narration coming out. But uh, so, which is why I put the transatlantic unity uh, as a bigger interest in, um, in the way we see events unfold. The um, impact on global order, which really is what uh, many of us are concerned about, because that is what we're going to be looking at in the future. Um, and I think what we're seeing with the Ukraine conflict is stress testing the resiliency of the current world order. Okay. And, you know, will the resolve of the Western powers weaken or strengthen over time? Suppose the war continues um, for a longer period, whose resolve is going to get weaker? And my sense is that the Europeans uh, may have a, uh, may weaken before anyone else, simply because of the immediate threat to a larger escalation, as well as economic interest and so forth. Um, so I think that uh, my own feeling is that it probably will weaken over time if it's a long war. Um, and so therein lies the question of whether transatlantic unity, how, how united is this going to uh, be and how strong will this remain? Again, I think that's a open to question. And so um, the, from the American side, um, when they're looking for, uh, the, and I think this was mentioned by the previous speaker, the kind of, um, I will put it as double standards. One of the things that this crisis has brought to the forefront is the way in which the media has covered it and the way in which the American uh, leadership has talked about it, making it a, I don't want to say a, a white man's uh, kind of uh, uh, war here, but there is the way in which its coverage was uh, uh, done that suggests the Western media gave a lot more sympathy for Ukrainian refugees and migrants and situation than say the Afghans. It was just, I think, very um, stark. And many Western media themselves uh, have analyzed that and suggested that this is what we're looking at. And I think that also creates a certain amount of um, tension in uh, the Western uh, approach versus non-Western approaches to the conflict. And then um, the, so, it, it, so the question of values and demo democratic uh, protections really does come up now when the Americans are using that as one of the main rationales for um, protecting Europe against uh, the rise of a top, uh, an autocratic leader who may not have uh, very clear boundaries. So, um, but at the same time, I think the, um, the, what we are seeing right now with the United States basically handing over Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan to a the jihadi groups, Taliban, with a hardly democratic uh, exit. So I think there is a, a, a question there. Um, of course, in the current world order, the, the question is, what are the prospects for a new world uh, order to uh, uh, emerge? And the revisionist powers that we see as in the current order is Russia and China. And the, again, it's um, the, prospects are not very clear, but I think it's quite obvious um, that Russia, no matter what happens, is going to come out the weakest. 
it will be the biggest loser as far as uh, we can see today. And uh, so, uh, but at the same time, if the dependency on China grows for Russia, which it will, then it will be a much weaker partner. And so China will emerge in a way of, uh, as, as having a important power, but one with Russia now being much more weak, it will have even a greater, in the Eurasia, Asia, Eurasia context, it will be the biggest winner in that, in, in that sense. Um, and so for the Americans, I think there's still, that's an open question in my mind, as far as whether the Americans are going to come out weaker or stronger. I think that's still a very much of an open question. And I think uh, the Western media and the American media are missing a big, big uh, sense of, uh, uh, of, of uh, really, you know, apprehensions in the rest of the world. And I can see it very clearly simply because I landed here from the US just two days ago in India and I can see the uh, differences here. Uh, finally, it's the uh, post uh, pandemic eco uh, the recovery question. And again, I think the, uh, the United States is looking around and has used in what is called the nuclear option of the SWIFT sanction. The financial sanction is called a nuclear option because it really is the strongest. And you know, once you do that, very hard to walk it back. Right now, it's only US, UK, and Canada that have used that, I think. Uh, but uh, it's the same group that has uh, stopped energy imports from Russia, which the Europeans have not. And I don't see them doing that right now. Again, that's part of the tension in the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship. But the costs of sanctions are, are felt well beyond Russia. And especially as the previous speakers have mentioned, we're coming out of a pandemic. And this is the last thing that one needed. I think these uh, you know, many countries are not well placed to absorb the costs. So, and there are also unintended uh, consequences. For example, if the US, which is considering sanctions on Rosatom, which is the civil nuclear agency in Russia, if sanctions are put on that, the, they are the, currently they deliver nuclear fuel um, and take um, spent fuel from several countries, including India, Slovakia, and China and Iran. Deepa, 30, 30 seconds, please. Okay. Um, if we are interested in non-proliferation, which the ambassador said we're going to see more proliferation, I, I, I think that's a possibility. But if we're really interested in non-proliferation, then we ought to be concerned that uh, we don't put sanctions on something, on an on a organization that actually is promoting non-proliferation right now. So I think we have to be careful about unintended consequences. Um, including, for example, the global, the IMF just released it this weekend saying that the global economy uh, growth is going to go down by 0.2%. Thanks to the war so far, if the war continues this year, it'll go down even further by 0.6% uh, for global GDP. That is a lot, especially when the um, situation has been dire to go into this war to begin with. And of course, um, I think uh, inflation is another big, big concern with the energy prices going up. So I think, um, you know, it's going to, whether uh, it's going to affect the dollar uh, position of the US, I think it will. I think things, you know, there will be a certain different types of alternative arrangements that may be looked at, but it's not so easy to displace it. So I don't see that happening. But I think there will be uh, some reforms now in other countries. And uh, my own view is that it's going to uh, undermine the legitimacy of US economic leadership, which again, will redound to China's advantage. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything on India simply because um, others have already talked about it. And the ambassador is the best person for that. So let me stop with that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, what you say about self-fulfilling prophecy, that is so very true. What you do not know and the world does not know, but I know only 
is that the White House had a bug in the Kremlin and they could hear the conversations and therefore President Biden kept saying that at such and such hour on such and such date, there will going to be an attack. I mean, it was, um, it was so surreal to have this kind of a definitive, I mean, I'm saying it tongue in cheek, of course. And uh, uh, there are almost as if there are two narratives. Uh, there is a narrative emanating from the West and the other narrative is from Russia, which has been, uh, which has been, uh, which is not getting disseminated. So we have a one-sided view uh, that that is a very, very big challenge. And uh, uh, I was quite struck by your remark about European uh, ability to withstand the sanctions for uh, a certain duration. Maybe we can talk about it more. Now, how long do we have the pleasure of your presence? Are you going to be with us or? Yes, yes. I will stay here at least for until 12, so. Until 12.30. All right, then. 30, 12, Sorry. 45, I can start. All right, good. So then we'll, I, I would have asked a couple of questions, but then thank you, we'll reserve it for a little later. With this, uh, can I invite Dr. Roger uh, Kangas to share his thoughts? Uh, Roger. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, I should say I'm uh, coming here from the UK, uh, not the US, and um, just recently came back from the South Caucasus and Turkey. And so uh, my contribution to our discussion really is to, first of all, get to the conflict itself. Uh, I want to approach the, um, you know, what is actually happening on the ground um, and probably move away from the, you know, focus on this as a U.S.-Russia rivalry or somehow a discussion of U.S. activities. Um, so, you know, in my time allotted, um, I hope to, to address some of these, and of course, by all means, I'm happy to answer any questions offered. Um, I should also add, and, and with full disclosure, um, you know, I'm taking this with my own views of the region. Uh, you know, these are my personal views. As someone who had the uh, fortune of being a, a student during, in the Soviet Union, uh, and then uh, who uh, was living in Tashkent, Uzbekistan during the Raspad or the breakup of the Soviet Union, and then um, has had the good fortune of coming back, um, you know, regularly to the region. I'm actually also trying to represent those views. Uh, you know, I think we're so focused on uh, what I would call narrative interpretation of media that we sometimes need to get back to the actual facts on the ground. And so with that, I'll simply say, you know, how, how, how do I view the conflict? Well, I'll take it from the perspectives of the neighboring states who see this as an invasion of one sovereign state of another, pure and simple. This is international law. Um, what the cause was, you know, if one says, oh, it's NATO enlargement, okay, an interesting argument, but at the end of the day, troops crossed a border. Um, right now they're, you know, targeting civilian buildings. Uh, we see the siege in Kiev uh, beginning. Um, and I look at it really as, as a continuum of past military tactics. You can look at Grozny in the late 1990s, Homs Aleppo in the last decade, uh, and what we'll see in Kharkiv, Kiev, and other cities will probably resemble that. Uh, there's already discussions of safe zones, evacuations of civilians, et cetera, uh, to make the leveling of these cities easier. Um, you know, initially the invasion in, uh, uh, employed a combination of professional and conscript soldiers. Uh, we're now seeing the introduction of mercenaries like the Wagner Group uh, and Syrian forces. Now I should say on the other side for the Ukrainians, of course, we see the Ukrainian army uh, standing up. They are now receiving volunteers from other parts of the world too, uh, as well as weaponry. And I, and I bring this up because while it remains a two-state conflict, Russia invading Ukraine, it is expanding to include other countries. Uh, and there's no question the concerns raised by my fellow panelists uh, are important. We're seeing uh, um, a broadening of this, of this engagement. Um, and I should say, as a final note, it also entails refugees. 
uh, we're looking at nearly 2 million refugees um, out of Ukraine in a fairly short amount of time. And I'm thinking in the Syrian conflict, it took several years to get to that number. Um, you know, we're now at it within a couple of weeks. You know, Ukraine is a country of over 44 million people. So of course the refugee challenge for the European neighbors among others uh, could be quite profound. I should just say on a personal anecdote, <clears throat> This morning on the on the uh, UK television during a commercial break, there was an ad for British citizens to help fund and support refugee families coming here to the UK. Um, the UK is doing this. Denmark is doing this, among other countries. Um, so, you know, why this conflict? And I agree. You know, this is an unnecessary war. You know, this is a conflict, and and I agree, Ambassador. You know, this is a conflict that shouldn't happen. Um, you know, we can look at the explanations, you know, I can go back, for example, to the July 12th, uh, 2021, uh, 5,000 word article by Mr. Putin, you know, entitled on the historic unity of the Russian and Ukrainian people, where he talks about, if you want to say the artificiality of the Ukrainian state and the, the necessity for the union of Slavic peoples. This is an argument that has come back and forth over time. Um, of course, not everyone believes it. This is something he may personally believe. Um, but Ukrainians, I'll be very clear and speaking with some Ukrainians just this morning, uh, this is not their perspective. Yes, they are Slavic. Yes, they would like to have closer affinity with the Russian people, but do not want to be part of the Russian state. Um, the question of denazification, that somehow the Ukrainian government is a Nazi regime. Um, Curious, I think this is rhetorical. Uh, it's meant to incite anger and hatred, um, but ultimately it's, it's sort of a vacuous uh, 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 claim. And even the issue, by the way, of NATO enlargement. And I know that people have brought this up that somehow the you know, NATO enlargement has caused this conflict. To be clear, every country that joined NATO did so because they asked to join NATO. They were not forced into it. And in fact, most NATO experts would say, you know, I'm not a NATO person, but most NATO experts would say the odds of Ukraine being a member state were probably slim right now and something for the future. Um, but to tell the Ukrainians they could never, ever be part of that organization um, challenges Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, Ukraine has agency. Ukraine should be able to, um, you know, present itself as a state in the international community, were it to join or not join uh, is, is up to it. Uh, by the way, the same holds true for Georgia, Moldova and other countries. Um, in terms of motivations or interests of Ukraine, and I'll get to that, it's a pretty simple one, it's survival. Uh, I've seen this personally in Bosnia, Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, and it's fascinating. Uh, and I would say from an analytical perspective, when a country is invaded, the fortitude of those people uh, can't be underestimated. Yes, it's possible and probable perhaps that Russia will conquer Ukraine, but will they conquer the Ukrainian people? That's a challenge. So how is this gonna impact the global order? And, and of course, the final question, the impact on the global economy. You know, And in the minutes remaining, um, I'd like to touch on a few key points. Uh, first of all, there has been discussion about recreating the security architecture of Europe. Um, both sides have interesting narratives on this, you know, whether one looks at a concert of Europe type, you know, great powers negotiating uh, Europe itself or, a, you know, a Europe from, you know, Vancouver to Vladivostok, where there's unity of, uh, across the boundaries. This event has created a rift and there is no question that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused a split in the Euro European sphere, where even countries like Poland and Hungary, who were you know, challenging allies in NATO and partners in the European Union, are providing support for Ukraine. Where Germany is increasing its defense, its defense budget and will exceed the 2% NATO limit that it for so long has never achieved. And you know, Finland and Sweden are now seriously contemplating NATO membership. You know, these are real concerns. You know that 
NATO or European countries are now rethinking their security and realizing that they may need to be part of a bigger uh, 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 security structure. You know, for other states, Japan, Taiwan, et cetera, are also looking at this and, and increasing their defense budget. So to a point raised earlier, are we seeing an arms race? Absolutely. For me, and I'll, I'll go back to a comment made by an earlier speaker, um, I would look to see what China's reactions are. Uh, Russia will be more dependent on China, you know, and, uh, you know, what will Mr. Xi do with his, uh, his partner in, in Mr. Putin? He's causing him a headache right now. Is he going to have to restructure his economic uh, system to help uh, uh, bail Russia out of a limited economic space, which gets to this final point on the global economy? Yes, what we are seeing is Russia being unplugged from the global economy. Um, and whether it's the SWIFT uh, discussion or whether it's energy transfers, by the way, the European countries and the EU have looked at being uh, Russia free by 2027. Uh, they are negotiating with countries such as Azerbaijan, uh, with those states in the Eastern Mediterranean, Egypt, Israel, as well as North Africa uh, to alter supply routes. So this is something the Europeans are looking at for, for, for uh, the audience to know. Um, but I'll just say on the economy, funny things happen in conflicts, right? Some sectors and some countries benefit. Uh, energy exporters are going to benefit in the short run. I see this in the Gulf states. Uh, food supplies are going to be altered and disrupted. Um, you know, I noted I, I was in uh, Georgia uh, just a couple days ago. 80% of their grain comes from Russia and Ukraine. This is going to have an impact on a third country. How do they manage this? And so we're going to start to see these second and third order effects uh, with the economies. Um, but I'll throw one, one final point on this. Um, and, and this is now dating myself, I suppose, uh, and a few of the older folks on this uh, call will understand this. During the Cold War and the height of the Cold War, if you think of the 1970s and 80s, we had a bifurcated global economy. You know, the Soviet Union was statistically insignificant to the West. The West was significant, statistically insignificant to the Soviet Union. Might we see that again? It's possible. Uh, We've, had, we've enjoyed this interconnected globalist economy for so many years, we've taken it for granted. But as it's happened in years past and not just during the Cold War, but World War I, and we can think of the mid 19th century, there have been times where economies haven't been connected. And I think we may be approaching that. Um, and so, you know, to conclude, if I'm looking at this conflict, and by the way, I don't see it ending soon. Um, Mr. Putin does not, he, failure is not an option. I agree with the previous speaker. And for the Ukrainians, defeat is not an option. This could drag on for years. Uh, I you know, was you know, in the Bosnian conflict, the siege of Sarajevo alone lasted for four years. Could we see that kind of duration here in Ukraine? Absolutely. And I'm seeing some reactions already from Russians and uh, Russian colleagues, I should say, um, in Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, uh, thousands of Russians a day are arriving, largely to deposit their money and assets and buying property in these countries to park their money outside of Russia. Uh, someone likened it to uh, 1917 after the Bolshevik Revolution where Russian financiers took their money to Istanbul, Shanghai, and Paris. Uh, maybe we'll see this again. I should add even last night here in London, a couple of Russian colleagues reflected on the same to me. So, um, you know, I think this is a changing situation and we'll see these ripple effects in the global order and the global economy continue. Uh, it saddens me perhaps that we have to go through this again because with those uh, broken periods, if you will, during the Cold War, we also had limited access with scholars, with academic exchanges, artists, et cetera. Um, I hope we don't go back to that, but I fear in the short run, we're going to see these restrictions as well, uh, which is most unfortunate. Um, 
I hope we can uh, have a lively discussion and I look forward to the questions uh, and the comments from my fellow panelists. So, sir, I will turn the microphone and camera back to you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you have given us all a lot of food for thought. I completely agree with you that Russia can take over Ukraine, but cannot hold Ukraine. And Russia yes. has completely, and for long time to come, lost Ukraine and the Ukrainians. So if that was one of the purpose, I think it has backfired. Uh, and it's, yes, that's what, uh, many of us also believe that the conflict will not will not end very soon, which is quite painful. I do note uh, your usage of two words, mercenaries and volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, you called uh, the the Russian, uh, let's say, participants, non-state actors and mercenaries, and the Western non-state actors as volunteers. Uh, that that is also quite interesting, but more about it later. Now, let me then turn to uh, Professor Jeffrey Payne. Uh, Dr. Payne, we are all ears and uh, thank you for your patience. And now uh, we look forward to listening to you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, both for your, uh, your comments and for your leadership of the session. Um, good evening, everyone. Or good morning. I, I honestly am over caffeinated, so I don't really know what time zone I'm currently in. But um, I'm going to, uh, first off, I have to say that I'm speaking uh, as well, um, just like Dr. Kangas, from my own personal viewpoints on this. And uh, I'm going to look primarily from the perspective of the maritime space. Uh, on the current conflict, which seems maybe perhaps a bit odd, given that this is a land um, uh, uh, determined conflict with some elements along the Black Sea coast. But um, I think I'm going to start with talking about some of the global implications first and then narrow down to the specific conflict um, in a little bit of a reverse order. Um, and so to start with, just to echo some of the things that Dr. Kangas already mentioned, is that this will be this conflict, unfortunately, will be another case in point beyond the horror of the conflict itself and, and the violence being witnessed um, of the fragility of the global supply chains that we all uh, rely upon. Uh, no matter the context, no matter the location, uh, whether you are a littoral state like India or a landlocked state like Nepal, we all rely upon the global supply chains, uh, if not for direct access, um, if, if not for that, then for the stability and price that global maritime shipping provides. And so this conflict be, uh, will have immense secondary and tertiary impacts on our supply chains. Um, grain was already mentioned, but the explosion in price of grain that is already occurring around the world and that will continue to occur because of the Ukrainian breadbasket that is being disrupted uh, because of the conflict will put food insecure populations in, in greater dire straits than before. So already existing uh, humanitarian efforts, say for instance, in Yemen, um, in parts of Africa, uh, parts of Latin America, um, and parts of, of Oceania, for instance, um, everything is gonna become more expensive, not only just in buying the grain or grain derived products, but getting them to the locations uh, to service uh, food insecure populations. So that's one immediate commodity that we should be talking about and focused upon. But it also will mean um, pressure on farmers. Uh, there's going to be an explosion, especially in commercially farming kind of industries, like say featured in North America, parts of Europe, uh, parts of South Asia and East Asia, to gain access to, to fertilizers, which are often nitrogen derived, which means that they're processed uh, based upon natural gas production. So if there's a disruption there, uh, you're going to have an explosion there uh, in terms of the cost of, of, of foodstuffs. And then from there, obviously, just the simple transportation of goods around the world will become more expensive because transoceanic shipping will become more expensive and also ensuring the cargo and the vessels and the crew uh, transporting those goods will become more expensive. So this is all kind of a, a snowball effect, um, which comes right after the blow of COVID. Um, but it is unavoidable given the circumstances and given uh, the, 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 the certain products that are key for global stability that are gonna be impacted by the conflict. And so an additional 
uh, maritime component that that does matter is in relation to the Black Sea. Um, Turkey's implementation of the Montreux Convention, which essentially has uh, shut down the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus for any vessel, either Ukrainian or Russian, that is a, a naval vessel or other potential combatant vessel, um, cannot now access those straits in order to get into the Black Sea unless they have already been notified as having a home port in the Black Sea. So Turkey did so hesitantly. Um, its Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, announced it, er, uh, President Erdogan enforced it because just like a lot of states, he's seeking to balance and figure out Turkey's approach to the conflict. But that certainly is going to have an impact on the status of the Black Sea. The Black Sea has already been dominated by the Russian Federation Navy um, since the, the seizure of the Crimea, but the, the efforts of other specifically NATO allied states that are also Black Sea littorals has been essentially erased for the time being to have an ability to project any kind of naval or coast guard power into the Black Sea. So as a result of this, you'll see a greater attention by NATO forces, specifically NATO maritime allied forces focused on the Eastern Mediterranean. And so the Eastern Mediterranean in a lot of these conversations in recent years tended to focus on natural gas exploration and disputed claims about underwater deposits. Now it's gonna become a much more traditional conversation about Coast Guard um, exclusive economic zone, territorial boundaries, and then naval projection, uh, which will complicate, of, of course, the, the positions of the Russian Federation um, in parts of the Mediterranean area from Libya to, to Syria and elsewhere. So that is something that this conflict is certainly impacting. Um, and then if you take an even larger view from the European continent, um, the Baltic and the Barents Seas uh, will become uh, greater focal points. They've already been focal points of, of NATO um, and Russian Federation and other regional powers for some time, but this conflict is going to intensify uh, the willingness to deploy assets there. Uh, the European Union specifically prior to the conflict spent a lot of time and attention formulating and releasing its status and perspective on the Indo-Pacific, their own concept of that. Um, this conflict is certainly redefine what their immediate priorities are going to be. So expect countries such as Denmark, which has a small but very, very capable Navy uh, to reimagine its positioning closer to home. Same with France, the same with Italy, uh, the same with the Germans and as well as the British and so on and so forth. So uh, a greater attention in the maritime sphere close to home. And then to look at it in a kind of an immediate sense, um, from the, the, the conflict parameters is, as I've mentioned, the Black Sea is essentially already controlled by the Russian Federation, but any long-term maritime goals of the Russian Federation beyond the Black Sea, when it comes to the Mediterranean or even beyond, are gonna be substantially inhibited because of the cost of the conflict. If everything goes smoothly for Russia going forward, they still will be um, believed by both uh, the exhaustion on their military personnel, the lack of funding due to the sanctions and their economic um, uh, uh, damages done to their economy. And so a lot of aspirations that the Russians have been signaling for years, such as a greater role in the Red Sea region, for instance, will be delayed if not overarchingly canceled. Um, and as a result, you'll see certain activities, say by the United States, to reimagine a focus on, on the Red Sea, because again, it's attached to that main corridor of the Eastern Med, which will also become critically important. So from a, a US point of view, what can we expect? I think I would diverge from some of our earlier speakers in this, this great panel um, by e uh, emphasizing the fact that what I think you'll see is actually much greater cooperation and coordination among NATO allies and other partnered states in the years to come when it comes to maritime security. Uh, imagine that as a separate co security construct than other things like land-based or air-based or even space-based issues. The maritime sphere will become a greater, uh, there will be a greater emphasis on from information sharing, interoperability, um, sharing of burdens, development of niche capabilities. All of this you'll see an intensification, which will, not to return into the Indo-Pacific, but will also have impact on the broader Indo-Pacific and, and the, the progression already being made there by uh, similarly aligned nations in that respect. So this conflict, while tragic and, and, and unleashing unspeakable horror, 
has um, certain long-term implications for the maritime sphere that are both very, very costly on the average consumer and on the health of certain nation states, uh, but also could lead uh, to an intensified focus on coordination and cooperation. And so I know there's been a lot of data thrown. Um, it's very late here, so um, I'm gonna try to wrap it up so we can move on to, to the, the questions, which I'm sure there's many. Uh, and so just my thanks again to all of you uh, and to your uh, attentions. And uh, Ambassador, I will turn the, the control back over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Short, sweet, pithy, and uh, substantive compliments, Jeff. Now that uh, I have, uh, let me use my prerogative as a chair uh, to straight away ask you a, a question. Uh, given the fact that you are a, especially a specialist on China, you know, some believe that uh, while the US had pulled out of Afghanistan, talking about focusing on on pressing national concerns and uh, to deal with China, uh, you see corporate America at work because corporate America has substantive interest, economic interests in China, but not very much in, in Russia. And that is one of the reasons why the US has dropped the ball on China and gone after Russia. Uh, what would you say to that? And secondly, is the American domestic agenda also a factor in going after Russia, Jeff? Well, sir, um, the, it's, they're both incredibly complicated questions. Um, the first I would say from my point of view and, and my experiences in China, um, granted I haven't lived there uh, in quite some time, but I lived in Shanghai for, for some years. Um, the American business, the bilateral economic relationship between China and the United States is immense. And it's immensely complicated and, and both economies are ensnared with each other. But that is in terms of a lot of basic commodity trading. Um, it's either foreign direct investment in specific projects in China by US interests or uh, Chinese investment in opening plants or uh, buying land in the United States, the exportation of simple commodities back and forth, mainly from China to the United States. The higher end of the economy um, in the developing technological sectors, for instance, there has been a substantive shift over the past couple of years and, and the demarcation between the two economic systems. Um, Silicon Valley is becoming much more sour about the long-term prospects of, of their, their footprint in the, in, in, in the PRC. And likewise, China is developing its own uh, substantive uh, technological sector that, that can stand on its own two feet, not only from its own domestic part, its domestic consumption rate, but also because of other markets that it has access to. So in some ways there is a cleavage that it is, is sort of being alluded to in these higher echelons of the, of the kind of uh, the high-end technological sector. Um, in terms of uh, the question about Russia versus China in terms of emphasis, I think again, sir, that that's based upon a lot of perspective. And I know just like Delhi, if I, to, if, if I was to observe the conversations in New Delhi related to the legislature and the bureaucracies debating topics, I would feel that maybe New Delhi um, has all sorts of ideas on the table. How does anyone make sense of any of this? Um, you can say the same about Washington, D.C. A lot of discussion can seem to be chaotic and all over the place. Um, and when it comes to the overall perspective, there has been, since the Trump administration, and continuing through the Biden administration, there has been a recognition that China's aspirations are not in alignment with what US interests are, especially in the Western Pacific. And we're not alone in that assessment. Uh, Japan certainly shares it, the Republic of Korea shares it, um, Australia sh shares it, and, and there are, are, are concerns, maybe not to the same degree, but um, in India. Um, and then that's not just the, the exhaustive list of, of the region. And so these are questions that are being developed, um, but I don't see it as a case where Russia was an easier kind of uh, uh, focal point to, to, to emphasize versus China. I think in a lot of ways, uh, China remains the preeminent um, uh, security concern, economic concern, political concern of the United States, um, but Russia has exacerbated a, a crisis. And so you see the U.S. respond. I mean, one thing that no one brought up and I think is worth mentioning is the conversation in Washington has been frantic 
over the invasion of Ukraine precisely because of the implications and the scale and how Washington became uh, having to respond to that, not only from statements from the president, but requests from allies in Europe and elsewhere. So I think a lot of it was uh, a, a realignment uh, in the short term of, of a lot of focus uh, on Eastern Europe. So I'll end there, sir, and turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about uh, 50 minutes. So we will spend another uh, 20 minutes uh, for discussion amongst the panelists and then take questions from, from the floor. Uh, my dear participants, kindly hold your fire. You, there are lots of questions. I will request the moderator thereafter to take the questions which are in the chat box. But let me kick it off by posing two questions to all the panelists. And uh, if any panelist has a question or a comment uh, to another panelist that can be posed. Uh, my first question is, what do the panelists uh, think, what would it take to quickly stop the conflict? Do you see any possibility or any turn of event that can bring this uh, bloodshed to a halt? Secondly, on the Taiwan issue, uh, how do you see the US, uh, how do you see China uh, reacting to the development in Ukraine towards Taiwan? Would it be encouraged? Would it be discouraged? There are two schools of thoughts. One is that the US is uh, kind of now focused more on Europe. Maybe that's an opportunity. Secondly, the a uh, valiant resistance put up by Ukraine would also send out a powerful message that uh, Taiwan may not be a uh, pushover. So what do you think of uh, that? Uh, so that is the two questions. These are two questions from me, but uh, uh, we'll go in the reverse order of uh, the speakers. So we'll start off with Jeff, but before that, does any of uh, the, do any of the panelists have any question, please? If you have, please add it to uh, uh, this basket and I will request the panelists to uh, respond to the questions as uh, their turn comes. Anybody has a question among the panelists? I have a question for, for, for two um, American colleagues, which is, um, is there a situation in which NATO gets involved in this? Okay, great question, thank you. Uh, any other question, please? All right, sir, ma'am, uh, we'll start with Jeff again. And Jeff, you have 180 seconds and your time starts now. Well, I'm gonna defer on the, the, the question about NATO and, uh, to Roger. Um, he's more uh, familiar with European affairs <laughs> than I am, but I can't, I will tackle the Taiwan issue. Um, honestly, and this is my assessment and, and my assessment only, first off, um, the eyes have not been taken off of the Western Pacific or the larger Indo-Pacific. Um, you can just go out to, to Indo-PACOM in Hawaii and see the level of activity and, and, and the emphasis and the engagement by the State Department, which is ongoing. Um, it's not necessarily on the front page of, of newspapers around the world, but it's, it's ever present throughout the region. Um, there's been a retooling of Indo-PACOM and, and the State Bureaus, Department of State Bureaus for this simple fact. Um, as for Taiwan, the biggest thing I would say if I was sitting uh, in Beijing is that um, 80 nautical miles, that is a, a, is a big variable. Um, Taiwan um, has a very effective, if small, and substantially outnumbered uh, uh, military compared to what the, the People's Liberation Army can bring to bear, uh, but that army has to get across 80 nautical miles. And... I think China sees the response from NATO and Europe on what has happened in Ukraine um, as also grossly underestimating the, 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 the political will of, of some of the, the allies in Europe and, and those same alliances that exist uh, in the Western Pacific. And so uh, I think there's certainly a lot of recalculations being played. I don't know if they would necessarily appear on CCTV and, and, and other uh, news sources, but um, certainly those conversations are being done. Um, and there's some really amazing Chinese scholars who have been writing about this, this you know, very balanced approach 
to uh, based upon looking beyond the Western Pacific, uh, looking towards Europe, looking towards the Middle East, looking towards Africa, and seeing uh, the complications that would erupt, um, and maybe there are blind spots in how how the PRC uh, strategizes. Um, so yes, the biggest difference I would say is add everything that happened in Ukraine and then add in 80 nautical miles and the complications in an amphibious assault. That would make a substantial difference. Any comment on uh, what would it take to bring the conflict to an end? Uh, negotiation um, uh, would be the simple word. Um, uh, a, a removal of the threat to to uh, to refugees and other civilians um, as a starting point, um, actually being enforced and, and restraint being shown. Um, but in terms of the actors involved, I would not speculate, but uh, I know a lot of it would be done through, I think, a mixture of multiple sources, public, private, um, and, and from the private sector. I think all of it would have to merge together um, to, to come to some type of, uh, of ceasefire, and then from there, an actual end of total hostility. Thank you. Roger, floor is yours. Okay. Um, I will forego the Taiwan question because I think Jeff uh, offered up an excellent explanation on that, and perhaps other colleagues might chime in. So I'll focus on the what will it take to bring the conflict to an end, or even a temporary end, but also, and, and I appreciate Cleo Pascal's comment about NATO involvement in the conflict, which we do need to think about. Uh, so to the first, uh, yes, uh, there are discussions, uh, there are back channel discussions. I've, you know, I'll, I'll be very blunt, I've worked uh, track two programming for nearly 20 years. And in, in many instances, of course, these sorts of discussions go nowhere. Sometimes they can help shape elements. Uh, track two discussions during the Syria conflict, for example, created opportunities for safe zones and the uh, safe passage of refugees or internally displaced persons. So that's a start. Um, and I would say uh, the, you know, not targeting civilian centers, not, uh, you know, targeting cities, urban areas, is going to be a would be a gesture that would help put us in that direction. Uh, so I, I think that you know at some point those discussions are happening. I know uh, you know Turkey uh, has offered its services. In fact, they had uh, you know obviously a, a, a mini meeting the other day. Um, India has, uh, is a is a potential uh, mediator. Uh, you need to find somebody who's neutral. You know, Belarus cannot be a mediator. The U.S. cannot be a mediator. It has to be a party that both sides trust. Uh, so, uh, and, and these efforts are be, are being put forth. The Ukrainian leadership and the Russian leadership need to bite. They need to actually respond to these. And so, my personal hope is we'll see this kind of discussion. At this stage, at best, we'll see a temporary ceasefire because the actual extrication of forces in combat positions is going to take a much longer time. Um, to the question then of, of NATO, in, uh, uh, NATO engagement, um, you know, the last two days now, there have been missile attacks along the Polish border. All it takes is one errant missile. And by the way, this happens in any uh, 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 military, right? Mistakes can happen. But if a Russian missile were to land in Poland, um, were to, you know, kill Polish civilians, that would be a potential game changer. Uh, if there are certain challenges, you know, across border again, uh, through other means, uh, if there was use of chemical weapons, um, we would start to see things escalate, even the declaration that tactical nuclear weapons could be used. Um, if we start to see these move in a direction of, you know, from the fantasy to the reality, so to speak, then you would see certain countries in NATO want to engage. And I know everyone says, oh, it would be the U.S. I agree with Jeff. This is the last thing the Americans wanted. Uh, if there's a so-called move, you know, pivot to Asia, move to the Indo-Pacific realm, this is the last thing that's going to happen, that should happen, because it's requiring the Americans to put attention and focus on Europe, which is what they don't want to do. It is prompting the Europeans to act. And I would say 
Germany, Poland, the Baltic states and others are the ones you need to watch. Uh, but again, excellent question. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much. I know that Victoria needs to leave. So can I request give the floor to Victoria? Please go right ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Prakash. Well, uh, just a very few minutes because I really need to run. Well, first of all, um, actually it was, um, I, I really enjoyed listening to everybody and uh, it was interesting to hear Mr. Kangas. And uh, uh, I guess what you also have noticed was not a real sleep over the tunnel or anything. And it shows actually who is the part of, who is the site to the conflict in fact. Uh, in this regard with the mercenaries uh, volunteers, because frankly, I do have somewhat reverse uh, information on who is coming for ideas, who is coming for money, who is coming for whatever other uh, reasons. So uh, this is something to um, debate. And also uh, yeah. I did expect to be a bit more than um, Western media uh, review that was presented, but. Thank you. But I'm, I'm really thankful to other panelists who were really giving very sober analysis and very interesting um, views of um, what's going on. It's, it's indeed um, uh, helpful with regards to what should be done to immediately stop the war. I think this is uh, the conflict. Uh, this is clear and this, is, uh, this has been pronounced already. Of course, the uh, negotiations, and we had them, unfortunately, those rounds that we had, and when we tried to uh, agree on humanitarian corridors, we had a breach of ceasefire on the other sides and actually shooting the civilians on the other side. We, we have it filmed, and uh, Ukrainian side would actually not allow uh, refugees to go uh, Russian directions, uh, though this has also been coming from, there's some Ukrainians that want to go west, they go west, but those who want to go east, they are not allowed to do that, because their society, they are split, it's not just black or white, and uh, they are people who, uh, who would like to be safe, but on the other side. So this is also true. So this has to be negotiations, and this has to be about demilitarization. Uh, there was a question there on neutral Ukraine. Of, of course, it is demilitarized neutral uh, Ukraine. Of course, this is NATO that uh, no longer comes to the board. I will just remind you very quickly of uh, the unification of Germany. You remember there were very long negotiations and the position of the Soviet Union back then was that uh, either Germany becomes neutral or uh, Gorbachev had this weird idea that uh, if you, uh, United Germany could become part of both Warsaw Pact and NATO, which was really funny, but I mean, he, he proclaimed that, so I have to mention that. Uh, and during those negotiations, we saw that uh, there was a, um, a explicit um, an um, explicit promise on the part of our Western colleagues at time, especially uh, guaranteed by Americans who were uh, Victoria, actually do you much mind, more going for Do you mind UK. if I come in? Do, do you mind if I come in with a little, a small question, yeah, please? Sure, sure. Uh, sure. As far as promises are concerned, we all know that West, East, North, South makes promises which are not fulfilled, but just park it for a minute. Let's just park it for a minute. My question is, and only you can answer that, that there is seemingly a lot of public pushback, uh, public protests against uh, what is happening in uh, Ukraine, in Russia. And uh, there are reports about arrests, there are reports about, for example, a small TV channel called Dosh Rain. Uh, they, everybody just protested and walked out. Do you think that these protests are ex, uh, ex accelerating or escalating? And what will be the impact of these protests on uh, the decision makers in Russia? Uh, I can tell you that I know that there is an um, attempt to portray those as the major part of uh, Russian society, which is not, there were some protests. I cannot deny that. I would not be denying that. But I can tell you that uh, actually talking to a number of people from different layers of the society, from different regions, uh, some people are afraid, of course, they don't understand how, what will be coming on. Uh, on. 
uh, of course, there is a kind of um, uh, kind of how you call not fear that much. Some some people have fear, but some people are uh, disintegrated, right? But um, the point is that there is much higher uh, support for uh, not just for Putin himself, right? So Putin is not just the kind of a person who behind whom um, people are standing, but there is the crisis when we see the cancel culture, when we see politicization, which was not starting with the February 24th, but we see with this uh, speed is splitting over to uh, cultural areas like music, Gergiev, uh, Matsuev, uh, to our sportsmen, to uh, handicapped sports. Point, 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 take, point so, taken, point taken, point so taken. Uh, can you, can I request you to wrap, can I request you to wrap up in 45 seconds, please go right ahead, 45 sure. seconds. Sure, so uh, we remember Germany, unification Germany and the promises given. We remember that, and this is a security dilemma. I've been telling you about this at the very beginning. So it does take demilitarization. It does take, uh, uh, well, I think all those were uh, Crimea, Lugansk, Donetsk uh, republics and uh, Russian language status, of course, taken into account. And uh, this will be it. And with Taiwan, I think um, China has always been trying to uh, wait for economic plus some military um, measures to ensure that Taiwan would smoothly go back to uh, China's mainland without offering, at least that's the general tendency, but we don't know what will happen now. And But it doesn't look that there are moves at the moment, apart from several, um, let's say, uh, uh, exercises, activities uh, we had. But um, I don't see at the point that China is probably, as some commentators said, is looking of what's happening around and they're waiting for all the sides to get weak right. in this regard. Thank you very much and uh, really appreciate your joining in. Uh, if you can stay on, we'll appreciate that. But I know that you have some commitments. Thanks again. Uh, Deepa, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, the, the Two questions. Uh, let me take the one on uh, Taiwan first. And I think Jeff has answered that uh, very well. Uh, let me just add something though, this is maybe a little different. I, you know, in, in research and studies, it has been shown that uh, countries don't necessarily look to other examples when they make a decision on something that is a very core interest to them. So we can't really generalize across uh, these uh, crises. But that said, I, I think that uh, in the case of Taiwan, it's, I think, very different in, in terms of um, what we can expect China. I think the Chinese, and they know that even the United States and other, others have accepted the one China principle and I, it's not clear that they are going to feel the kind of commitment and credibility and resolve shown on the European theater. I'm less uh, inclined to say that we can expect that in the Indo-Pacific uh, on Taiwan. Um, this has always been a little ambiguous, which is why the Americans have always said there's a certain level of strategic ambiguity that, that they want to maintain when it comes to Taiwan, unlike say in NATO, uh, in, in the NATO arena. So that, well, that gives me a little bit of a idea that perhaps the Chinese will not, um, you know, they may actually be more emboldened because they may not expect the same kind of resolve uh, as it was shown in um, the Euro in European theater. Um, the other thing I want to say is that here, I think we sometimes don't see the element of emotion. Um, and I don't think we can underestimate that. There's a lot of emotion that were running high in the United States on Ukraine and what was happening in Europe. There's an identification that's very strong, which I don't think will happen in the case of Taiwan and China. I think it'd be more difficult. And I think the Chinese may um, see that as well, um, the, the way in which other countries have seen that uh, playing out in the media and so on. So my own view is that 
that uh, while you cannot extrapolate from what's happening now there, I think the Chinese probably feel pretty confident that when the time is right, that they will be able to act, uh, not because of what happens in Europe or not. And, but, but I don't see it uh, being emboldened immediately simply because I think one thing the Chinese want is a certain amount of stability, especially in the post-pandemic economic uh, environment. I think that may be what might keep them. Okay, the second question, the, the quickly on the- uh, 30 seconds, please. 30 seconds, yes. Let me say that um, a quick uh, resolution, I don't see a quick resolution, but I think whatever happens, it'll have to have a face-saving component, a big face-saving component, especially for Putin. Um, so, you know, it cannot be what was happening before the invasion where the uh, United States and so forth were very publicly making commentary. It will have to be done in a very different fashion. I think behind the scenes, ceasefire. Perhaps one thing I would say is that on the Ukraine admission to NATO, I've always wondered why it, we couldn't simply say that, take it off the table for 15 years, uh, not saying that it's completely, uh, saying that, we're, that, that they've given up the ambition to join NATO, but that at least for X number of years, choose whatever, 20 years or something, it will not be a factor. At least I think you need something that will A, buy time and buy face. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Cleo, the floor is yours. Can I add one more very quick question? Dr. Uh, Olapali mentioned uh, in the context of Taiwan, strategic ambiguity. Uh, any thoughts on why President, Put President uh, Biden dropped strategic ambiguity when it came to Russia and Ukraine to say very clearly that they will not enter into a conflict in Ukraine uh, but only if the NATO soil is attacked would they enter the conflict. So uh, why, I mean, I was just been wondering, would strategic ambiguity not have been a better, uh, would not have served the purpose better? And uh, again, you, you have three to four minutes, so please go ahead. Okay, that's fine. I'll be very quick. Yeah, I think, uh, I think um, our, our my American colleagues would probably know more more clearly, but I think there's a, a, a great concern of there being some confusion or missed messages or an accident that could cascade really quickly. So I think in, in the case of uh, Ukraine, that may have been a factor in the decision making, I'm not sure. In the, for, for Taiwan, um, so what I'm getting, the sense I'm getting out of uh, Beijing is that actually the hawks are pushing Xi because she's made some uh, kind of odd, odd moves that have, um, uh, made him look weak. And one of them, for example, was uh, getting that hero of Balwan to be a torchbearer in the, in the Olympics and uh, alienating India. So, um, and, and another is uh, kind of looking a bit wishy-washy in the context of all of this. I think, you know, I take uh, the Chinese Communist Party its word when they say that they, they're going to try to take Taiwan at some point. And uh, what, I, what I see from the Western Pacific, and I mean, Taiwan is a critical component of breaking the first island chain, which is what they need to do if they're going to get the PLA Navy out into the wider Indo-Pacific. They're constrained by the first island chain to a certain degree, especially around things like subs. They need to break it. And, when, and, and Taiwan is an effective way of breaking it. And when you look at what they're doing in the second and third island chain, for example, Western Pacific, that as, as was being brought up, you see activity extreme, that's extremely strong, very successful political warfare. You know, in 2019, they flipped Kiribati and Solomons. Uh, in Kiribati, they're trying to take over an old World War II U.S. Uh, airstrip and uh, revitalize it in Solomons. They managed an incredible maneuver where they had this corrupt pro PRC PM uh, who looked like he was going to get kicked out of power, and they got the Australians somehow to come in and, and prop him up and give them an excuse to bring in what now is Chinese police advisors, and just two days ago they announced a shipment of weapons had been found, probably Chinese weapons. In the case of uh, the catastrophe in Tonga, you know, the Australians deployed the HMAS Adelaide, uh, and the ship broke down in port, had a massive electrical failure rendered inoperable, but the Australians had told the Americans, don't worry, we've got it covered, and so all that was sent was a destroyer, not an amphib. Uh, that could have helped and Chinese sent an amphib. 
Um, and if you look at what's happening with the negotiations of the freely associated states, they're, they're, they are not uh, moving ahead in the way that one would hope. And that's, again, giving political warfare openings to China and the region. I, I spoke today to somebody about the uh, national security um, coordinator position in Palau, which was uh, the Americans asked them to set up the position, and they set up the position, and then haven't funded it. And the information flows only one way, and that's creating a lot of uh, consternation within Palau. So yes, you know, I'm absolutely, um, I'm, Dr. Payne is absolutely correct. You know, the, the, the words Indo-Pacific um, contains like the new Indo-Pacific strategy, a lot about the Pacific Islands, and Indo-PACOM talks about it. But when you look at delivery on the ground, um, China's running circles uh, around a lot of Western engagement in the second and third island chain. And if they can island hop, basically almost to Hawaii, if you're talking about Canton, um, and create a situation where once they go into Taiwan, if they go in hard and heavy and cut off communications, and they also have this massive political warfare advantage across the Pacific Islands, the US can find itself cut off extremely quickly from the Pacific. Yep. So we talk a lot about losing Taiwan and what, what that'll do to Cambodia and Malaysia and all of those sort of that, that north-south axis, but that east-west axis is all, also not secure. And the amount of effort China's putting in there makes me suspect that they think that it can be a component of a Taiwanese uh, fall of Taiwan strategy, uh, which Got would it. isolate 30, Japan. 30 seconds, please. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, let me jump the queue and uh, invite George for a quick question or comment. Uh, I cannot pronounce your name, surname, so I'm sorry about that. So, and please pardon my calling you by your first name. 30 seconds, please go right ahead. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, George. So thank you very much. By calling me by the first name, it is a, a great, uh, um, how to say, pleasure for me because it is coming from a friend, you know. Thank you. So uh, I am really very happy to, to listen to a lot of opinions. And uh, of course, um, there are pro costs, you know, which is natural. What I would like to say is that as far as Romania is concerned, we are neighbor you know, with Ukraine. And uh, I would like to stress from the very be beginning that Romania has no intention to enter into military act in this, in this matter. But we are concentrated very much, and I think we are doing a good job on humanitarian aspects. You see, there were about 800 uh, 800,000 people that cross Rom Romania to West, and not, of, not all of them remain there, but around 200,000, they are there. Uh, we are cooperating very well with the, with the Indian uh, embassy in, uh, in Bucharest to assist the Indian citizens to repatriate uh, to, to, to India. This is just a few words about Romania, about the situation. Uh, uh, I'll, requ I'll request you to be uh, to wrap it up quickly, please, because uh, you I have had you jump the queue, and there are lots of people okay. waiting. Okay. So kind, kind. Okay. Only one met one point, uh, and that's all. Uh, the question is, when and how this conflict will be over. And my answer is that nobody can know because we are dealing with a very dangerous unpredictability from some, from some sides in this conflict. Thank fair you very enough. much. Fair, in, fair enough, thank you. Uh, who is the moderator? Who will, who will handle the questions, please? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Madhu and Vini, there are various questions at the uh, chat box. So can you go ahead uh, one by one? And, no. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, yes, okay. Yes, uh, they're all in the chat box, is it? Yes, yes, sir. Because we have don't have much time, we'll not be able to go one by one. So let me then, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, Madhu and Vini, to interject. Uh, but let me kind of go through them quickly and... I'll have to pick and choose. Okay, sorry. Uh, 
Thank All you, right, sir. thank you. Uh, and, uh, I would like to mention, sir, Professor Manmohini Kaul, uh, former chairperson of uh, JNU Indo-Pacific Studies. She is also here and uh, she's a senior professor and uh, I would like to uh, invite her. Uh, meanwhile, you can read some uh, some of the question in the chat box. So no, ma'am, let, 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 us, let us invite judge. her. Let us invite her and Miss um, uh, Call. I don't think she's ready. Anyways, so we'll come to that. Now, questions are in the chat box or Q and A. Where are the questions? Uh, yes, sir. In the chat. In the chat. Let me first thank you. You can after this. I don't have any questions or any comments to make. I enjoyed the listening to the few speakers. They were excellent, and everyone has a view. I also have a view. That will be for the next time. I can see. I have also chaired many sessions. I know what what it's an onerous duty. Please go ahead with your questions. The youngsters have been asking. Thank you, Amit Singh. Thank you very much. Next thank time. You. Thank you for uh, the empathy. I need all of that, but uh, thank you. And we look forward to listening to you. Uh, okay, let me come to the chat box uh, question. All right, uh, question for Dr. Deepa. Uh, conclusion one of your appointment then the users on the Russia is supposed to attack. Well, I cannot understand the question. Miss Cleo, uh, there is uh, the question for you uh, about the election of the new uh, Korean president who is from the conservative group and normally takes a hardline stance on North Korea. Uh, so what will be the impact of uh, his election on uh, the North Korean quest or determination to hold on to the, its weapons of mass destruction? I, th I feel like you should be the one answering this question, Ambassador. <laughs> I, I, I don't answer any difficult questions. You ask me about the weather, I will answer them. But difficult questions are all for you. <laughs> so students, that's a professional diplomat. Learn, learn from that. <laughs> Um, I'm, uh, yeah, so I think, so for me, what's important is, uh, he, one of his platform, uh, planks was to, uh, build a stronger relationship with Japan. And if, uh, South Korea and Japan start to work more closely together, especially in conjunction with the U S then, uh, the, the dynamic changes substantially. And there's even the possibility of South Korea, um, perhaps, be, you know, being a quad plus or even quad. Uh, which again makes it much, makes the quad much more rooted in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so uh, the the um, North Korean question is is ex is extremely complicated because it it brings in China as well uh, as part of a kind of proxy uh, engagement. So I, I'm not going to touch that. But just to say that uh, as if there if, with countries like Taiwan and Japan that have any doubt about US commitment to the region, we're likely to see uh, all of them uh, uh, increasing their own defense capabilities. And we're already starting to see it happen and we're already starting to see them deploy a little bit further out. So Japan, for example, because of this concern around the Pacific Islands has announced the opening of uh, new diplomatic missions um, in Kiribati and, and in New Caledonia. So that the zone is changing and hardening to a certain degree. Um, but the issue that was brought up around the cost of food and oil supplies and how that will affect Pacific Islands um, is, is worth noting because if they start to have economic insecurity, uh, that's an opening for China to come in with loans. And we know they come in with the commercial aspect or the economic aspect, which has strategic implications and also uh, a lot of criminal activity that comes along with it. So the increase in oil and food prices is potentially an opening for some of these economically weaker countries, especially after COVID for increasing Chinese engagement through the commercial sector. So you might end up with more of this Chinese political warfare footprint at the same time as you're getting more of the kind of free and open Indo-Pacific hardening of the hard power component of it. Thank you. There is a very good question by Satendra Gup, Gupta, I think, uh, who says that uh, the Russian version or Russian a uh, narrative is being blocked by the Western media. Should uh, the democratic Western media not allow uh, 
perspective from the other side also to be to be disseminated so that a balanced view can be taken uh, any panelist any any colleague would take a shot at it uh, yes roger I'll please go right i'll take ahead. a i'll take a shot at this um if you don't mind sir uh, please go right ahead yeah the um in terms of the narratives uh, the russian narrative is is actually out there i I watch it every day, um, and uh, you know whether it's uh, streaming sources or um, you know media sources that I can access, not just from Russia, uh, but from Kazakhstan, from Armenia, from other countries. And uh, it's interesting as well to look at the comments and to see the debate that's going on in the broader Eurasian space, uh, because I do think it gives us a better view of how this is interpreted. Um, and in terms of facts on the ground, that's what needs to be consistent. Interpretation, opinion, we're going to see differences. There's no question. Um, but when you know things are denied or things are perhaps interpreted another way, and I know everyone's throwing out the phrase fake news, you know, that somehow things are manipulated. There's videos that are drawn a certain way. Um, dispense with that for a moment and look at what's being presented. And, and I do think you are seeing other narratives out there. Um, the fact though that in other parts of the world, uh, whether it's support for the UN resolution, whether it's you know even civilian support. I mean, I don't know how many cities now <laughs> I've been to where they're coloring their major buildings or sites you know, in the Ukrainian colors. People are wearing Ukrainian pins in the meetings. Um, this is a voluntary action, and these are in countries, you know, around the world. And and so there is a sympathy from other media's and in other spaces. It's not just in West versus or U.S. versus Russia. This is a uh, this is this uh, event is being covered by the global media, uh, and so it yes, it's imperative we look at all the interpretations and then assess. Uh, uh, sort of views, but facts, harder to, to say facts exist or don't exist. Back to you, sir. My two pennies worth, my friend, uh, is that it's all about the narrative. If you mm -hmm. control the narrative, uh, you control things. And uh, there, there is, uh, uh, any side will do whatever it can to push its narrative mm -hmm. and to quash the narrative of the other side. That is uh, a fact that we need to live with. Miss um, Riang, do you have a question? Yes, Deepa, I'll come to you. One yes. second, please. I saw uh, Riang posting a question. Riang, do you have a question? It has already been answered. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, the, uh, Dr. Olapalli, please go right ahead. I was simply going to add to what Roger said on the narratives, what you said. I think uh, the narratives are something that um, when you, you look at foreign policy issues in across the board, it's very difficult to get the much more open and diverse viewpoints in a country when there is a foreign policy crisis. It tends to the mainstream media in the countries tends to follow that country that governments lead. And this is not different even in the United States. Uh, we don't have, for example, opinion pieces and so forth in the New York Times and the Washington Post. It is fairly tailored to the US view, just like I think so uh, in other places. Politics sort of stops at the water's edge and you do get a pretty much uniformity, which is unfortunate. We have Twitter, we have all the social media so that's something that's much more open in some sense. And I think but that's only accessible to, you know, and then we have the question of the fake media and so forth, fake news and so forth. So, but on mainstream media, I do think there is a problem of narrative that is going to be a more governmental version. Thank you. There's a question from Sanjesh uh, to uh, Ms. Pascal and I would invite my American colleagues also to weigh in if they like. Uh, has the American withdrawal, the hasty American withdrawal from Afghanistan, did that have an impact on the American decision uh, to go after Russia? 
would it have been a, i mean it's a hypothetical question would it have been every, any different the, the the reaction if uh, the withdrawal from afghanistan had been smooth so um I think I'm gonna defer. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the weather instead. Isn't that how you do it, Ambassador Prakash? No, that is my domain. So I mean, <laughs> you you are the strategic thinker, and we look at you for answers. So we we are all ears. So uh, I don't understand the rationale of the Afghanistan response. Um, so I find uh, the the way the way it was done. Uh, I I don't understand the thinking that went into it. And so uh, what that tells me is I don't understand uh, how the administration makes decisions. Um, usually, you know, at the time you can say I don't understand it, and then there's a few months and then you can start to see the patterns and try to figure it out. Um, I, ha I, I don't understand it. And um, as a result, I don't, I, I don't really understand the decision making that's going into uh, this, in, into what's happening with Ukraine and Russia. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure where the center of uh, intellectual gravity, moral gravity, is, um, and so I don't know how one affects the other. Um, the uh, and and I think that that just that that uncertainty among people who are trying to follow this um, is what's causing a lot of colleagues within the Indo-Pacific a lot of consternation. Because if, if you don't understand why the decisions are being made um, uh, and, and where the lines are, uh, then it makes it hard for you to incorporate, whether you agree with those decisions or not, a, a firm line into your own decision making. So uh, looking from the point of view of the Indo-Pacific and, and colleagues who I speak to in the region, the fact that Afghanistan is still mildly incomprehensible, well, actually is incomprehensible. In terms of things like the leaving behind the equipment, including the biodata of of Indians who had helped the administration, and uh, the way that of guns, yeah, and and so I don't understand it. I'm I'm not, I'm just being honest. I don't understand it. So I and and as a result, I I can't anticipate. If I don't understand, I can't anticipate. So I don't understand how why these decisions are being made. What that. The, the only concrete thing I can take out of that is I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. And as a result, um, that variability is being incorporated into um, decision making in other places where uh, the US may be considered more of a wild card, uh, actually, than it, than it may have been otherwise. But in terms of wh why those decisions were made, I would definitely defer to my, uh, to my US colleagues on that or US based colleagues on that. Perfect. Uh, the, Roger, the Jeff, yeah, yeah, Jeff. yeah, yeah, Any, yeah, yeah. Jeff, would you like ahead. to go? Um, no, uh, Roger, honestly, I'll defer because I'm, I'm not quietly, I'm not quite entirely sure which administration we're talking okay. about. Okay. Because I think okay. that's the key. Roger yeah. and then Deepa. Okay. Um, yeah, very, very quickly. And, and I appreciate the, um, if you want to say that the consternation or concern here, um, Knowing the knowing the process, and and by the way, I'll just say it, full disclosure, uh, working in Afghanistan since in and out of Afghanistan since the 1990s, uh, during the first Taliban administration, um, it's a country that I personally hold near and dear to my heart, and my friends and colleagues there, uh, I'm in touch with on a regular basis and know what they're going through. Um, you know, the decision to withdraw was a decision made by the last three U.S. administrations, finally executed by the current one. Um, there was going to be a point where the U.S. was to leave. Um, so the decision itself, I think, is fairly straightforward. Um, now, to how it happened, and it was utterly shambolic. Uh, it was a disaster. I'll be not so blunt, <laughs> I guess, or I'll try to be diplomatic in saying uh, poor decisions were made. Uh, and, um, and that's actually something that will be the subject of investigations and studies for quite some time. And so to uh, Cleo, you will get some answers on this uh, down the road and you're not gonna be happy uh, with what you find. It's going to be frustrating 
and disappointing. Um, and th those are kind words. Um, I know, you know, many Americans who were involved in this are screaming mad about what took place. Now, I'm going to put that in a box and say that's the Afghan problem or Afghan space. The Ukrainian problem is different. Uh, again, this is a the U.S. is not a belligerent in this conflict. It is not a U.S. decision to invade Ukraine, and so you know it, it, it's we're the U.S. is more in a reactive mode, as are European states, as are Asian states, or others. I think we're watching this. I, someone very early on said, you know, NATO is on the sideline. Absolutely, and it's criticized for being on the sideline. Yet at the same time. If it goes into the fray, it becomes a belligerent and it has a war with Russia. And I don't think people in NATO want that to happen. I don't think folks at the end of the day want to go to war with Russia. So the thought process in Ukraine, which by the way, different people from those who were part of the decisions on Afghanistan, um, is how to minimize a presence, help the Ukrainians, but as others in this room have said over the last couple of hours, uh, bring a cessation of hostilities. That's the priority right now. And so um, blinkages, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say reactions in Ukraine are a result of Afghanistan. I put these as two separate spaces. Perfect, perfect. thank you. Deepa, yeah. two yeah. minutes. Yeah. And uh, um, just, one, just one second. Uh, okay, uh, please go right ahead, go right ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, just uh, on the question of how to explain the Afghan decision, I just want to bring in Cleo the domestic politics. I think the support for the Afghan war has been waning, and the Democratic Party is particularly, but of course Trump as well, uh, has uh, took a decision. So I think the reason it's not an international foreign policy decision as much as really directed by domestic. Uh, politics and, and, and priorities of that uh, in the U.S. But I do think, I, I, I kind of differ a little bit from Roger's analysis of the Ukraine situation, because I think one linkage I see is the foreign policy team um, of by Mr. Biden after the Afghan debacle, especially led by uh, Secretary Blinken, I think, took such a beating, a public beating, and I think it was uh, humiliated in some sense. And I think Blinken, from what we know and what we have, I've talked to various people, he took it very personally. And I think when this happened in Ukraine, I think the idea was that we have to come back, you know, show that the U.S. is back, it's in control, it will come to the aid in a kind of more what we expect the Americans to do in that sense. And so I think they felt compelled to take a lead, leading role and to take a firm and position on this and be very public and open in the, in the sense of what they were, what America was doing. So I do see a, a linkage. It's an uh, issue of credibility. And I think, um, you know, uh, we will, when we look back at this, I think we'll see that linkage even more clearly. That's what I, my, my take on this is. Thank you very much, Dr. Olapalli. Uh, I think we have had a fascinating discussion. I have learned a lot. Uh, searching questions, probing questions have been asked, which shows how interested all the participants are. Uh, I would particularly like to thank and uh, appreciate the presence of young scholars like all of you who are here. Uh, I, it's heartening as a, a former diplomat to see your interest in foreign affairs and international relations. Believe you me, uh, as India progresses, as India re-emerges, Everything that happens in the world or so much that happens in the world will impact India and our appreciation of the challenges of and the opportunities in international affairs will stand us in good stead. So uh, I would encourage all of you to look at foreign affairs or, because please do understand foreign policy is nothing but an extension of the, uh, domestic policy and they are intertwined. Um, so thank you very much. And with the, these words, I hand over the floor to Mr. Pramod Jaiswal and, doc, and or Dr. Amit Singh, and would like to thank every panelist 
for your graciousness. Uh, you you have put up with my uh, idiosyncrasies, so uh, you know I uh, really appreciate that. I know that when I am speaking and there is an interjection, I feel like pulling out my non-existent gun. But uh, you have been very indulgent. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Thank you, sir. And uh, yes, uh, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, Atmaram Sanatan Dharma College, and Republica, the Association of Political Science of our college, I would like to extend my warm thank to each one of you for put forwarding your views with the learned audience and yes, our young scholars. And uh, I would like to underscore one thing here is that from today onwards, uh, Delhi University, uh, we have started our mid-semester break. And during this mid-semester break, there are more than 100 students had joined this particular discussion. And uh, they have also participated because I have noted various uh, pointed questions they have asked uh, to the various panelists. And most of these kids are just first year and second year of their undergraduation. There are few people who are doing their PhD in international relation and post-graduation. So on behalf of the niece and yes, uh, our college, I would like to thank Ambassador Prashad, uh, Prakash for chairing this session. Uh, panelists like Cleo Pascal, Victoria Panova, Deepa Olapalli, Professor Roja and Jeff Payne and my friends from uh, Romania, my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Manmohini Kaul, and all other faculty members of our college, including principals, uh, a warm thank uh, to help us in organizing this particular inaugural session of our two-day uh, political science extravaganza in our college. And yes, a special thank to Dr. Pramod Jaiswal because without his cooperation, this particular inaugural session would not have been completed. And in the end, I would like to mention here is that yes, India is a country who has propagated this particular idea called Ahinsa and Mahatma Gandhi and the other scholars are uh, champion of these uh, words. So I also uh, would like to support here is that yes, India should take some proactive role and bringing both these countries, Ukraine and Russia to a discussion level. And uh, yes, we can do, the, uh, do or initiate this particular talk at this moment because uh, we have a uh, engaging and uh, uh, powerful prime minister at the helm of affairs here at the New Delhi. So with these words, I would like to thank in each one of you, specifically my dear students for uh, participating wholeheartedly in this particular program. And I request every one of you, please on your videos for the virtual group photograph. And uh, yes, Dr. Uh, Pramoj, Pramoj Jaiswal is here. So if you would like to say something uh, towards the end, Pramoj ji. Uh, thank you, Amitji. I just want to thank all the speakers. It was a wonderful discussion and we we'll hope to have you again in future. And we also want to have uh, Delhi University for our further events in future. If any of the students are willing to join us for internship program, please join us. Let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pramoji.